Tonight, the sprint to the nomination. The big night is going to be in November when we take back our country and truly we do make our country great again. Fresh off his decisive win in Iowa, Donald Trump is back in court defending himself in one of the many lawsuits against him. The legal and political fights he's waging and how both are colliding heading into New Hampshire and Super Tuesday. And this is the M777. An American gun hidden in this woodland. The urgent fight and impassioned appeals for help. We take you to the Ukrainian front lines where the country's president is pleading for help from the U.S. as it wages a battle with Russia and dwindling supplies. Good evening, I'm Phil Lipoff in tonight for Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We are following those stories and much more, including that dangerous Arctic blast engulfing much of the country in sub-zero temperatures, wind and snow, and disrupting travel on the ground and in the skies. Plus the latest development in the Gilgo Beach murders and why another woman could be included among those killed. And there were Emmy winners, and then there were those who cemented themselves as EGOT winners. All the big wins and upsets from the primetime Emmy Awards. But of course, we begin tonight with former President Trump's decisive victory in Iowa. Trump dominated the Iowa caucuses last night, defeating GOP presidential hopefuls Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis with more than half of all the votes. Fresh off that win, flying immediately to federal court here in New York City to attend his civil trial in the defamation case brought by writer E. Jean Carroll. More on that from Aaron Katursky in just a moment. In the first round of the fight for the presidency, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis finished second. But now all eyes are on New Hampshire. We are a week away from the primary there. Nikki Haley, former governor of South Carolina, is already there, putting her third place finish in Iowa in the rear view. Haley keeping to her vow not to take to the debate stage without Donald Trump, who wouldn't agree to participate either. But first, as the field narrows in the race to the White House, ABC's Rachel Scott has it all covered from the campaign trail. Less than 24 hours after a blowout victory in Iowa, Donald Trump heading straight to a Manhattan courtroom, choosing to attend day one of the defamation case against him by writer E. Jean Carroll. A jury will determine how much he owes Carroll in damages. After court, it was on to New Hampshire. Trump hoping to cement his lock on the Republican nomination. I really think this is time now for everybody, our country, to come together. We want to come together. Trump won Iowa with 51 percent of the vote, smashing historical records. Still, nearly half of Republicans chose someone other than the former president. And turnout was low, just 14 percent of Republicans showing up to caucus. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis coming in second, with former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley right behind him. Haley flying into New Hampshire, where polls have her within single digits of Trump. She says it's now a two-person race, Haley versus Trump, and she's refusing to participate in any debates without him. Just to put a finer point on it, you're not going to do a debate here in New Hampshire unless Donald Trump is on the stage. I mean, that's who... I'm running against. There is nobody else I need to debate. I have had five strong debates and have done plenty of them. He can't hide forever. At some point, he's got to get on a debate. You... DeSantis, who trails in New Hampshire, hopscotching ahead to Haley's home state of South Carolina, which holds its primary on February 24th. Look, she was governor here for six years. Can you name major achievements yeah. under her tenure? I mean, t tell me if there are. Because she hasn't been able to do it. Haley brushing it off. I'm sure he had a great time. South Carolina is a great state. But he's in single digits in South Carolina and single digits in New Hampshire. He's been invisible in both states. He is not my concern. I'm going after Trump. Phil, you heard Nikki Haley there say that she will not debate unless Donald Trump is on the stage. Trump has provided no indication that he plans to debate. So now the ABC News WMUR debate for Thursday night has been officially canceled. The New Hampshire primary is just one week away from tonight. Phil. All right, Rachel Scott in New Hampshire. Rachel, thank you. On the heels of his Iowa victory, Donald Trump touching down in New York today to attend jury selection in the E. Jean Carroll defamation case. Just one of the several cases he's involved in. Senior investigative reporter Aaron Katursky joins me here in studio with what happened in court today. Aaron. It was a, a pretty dramatic moment for former President Trump choosing voluntarily to come to court, celebrating his Iowa victory, 
by coming into a courtroom where he actually had no role other than to stare at the potential jurors who would decide how much in damages, if anything, he should pay to E. Jean Carroll for defaming her. You'll remember he, won, he lost a previous judgment. She got $5 million out of him. She's suing for more. And the former president twisted in his chair every which way to see these people, wow. this different uh, collection of citizens than, than he's used to on the campaign trail, who are going to sit in, in judgment of him. He left after jury selection, so he wasn't there when uh, 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 an attorney for E. Jean Carroll said that the former president keeps defaming her, even, even after he lost a case last year, and asked the jury to make him pay to try to put a stop to it. Well, as we pointed out, this is just one of several cases. Uh, you know, Georgia, there, there are just so many cases he's involved in. How uh, are those trial schedules, those cases, going to be sort of intertwined with the 2024 campaign? He's a defendant in two civil cases. He's got four criminal prosecutions, more than 90 criminal charges that he's facing. And, and this is how it's going to be for him, the intersection of, of, of politics and, and the law. And so while other rivals, Haley and DeSantis, are, are digging in in the states, uh, he's detouring to courtrooms. Now, some of it's by choice because it's working for him. Right. Remember the Iowa entrance poll, two-thirds of caucus goers said he'd be fit for office even if he's convicted of a crime. Uh, but, but he is also eventually going to be forced into court when he's a criminal defendant with the first trial scheduled right now for the day before the Super Tuesday. Program. Right. There will be moments where he must be in court and moments that he can choose to be probably as he moves forward into the into the election year, he's going to have to decide between the two. In and out yeah. throughout for All the right. next few months. Aaron, thank you very much. I'm joined now by ABC News legal contributor Shauna Lloyd. Shauna, it's good to see you. Let's continue the conversation, take a closer look at the case involving E. Jean Carroll that got underway today with a defendant like Donald Trump, who is so well known, an imposing figure in any room, polarizing as well. How difficult is it to find a jury impartial? You know, it's interesting. Whenever we talk about figures like this, they do have an impact on the case and on the jury. But for the most part, jurors really do take their responsibility seriously. And when the judge says disregard that and pay attention to the facts of the case, that's really what they're going to focus on. They're going to make a determination as to what the dollar amount should be. And although he is this larger than life figure, it really is going to come down to what they feel the damages are that she is due. From what we've learned about the jury pool from their answers in the courtroom, what's your impression so far? So far, it seems like we have a mixed bag. What they're trying to do is eliminate anyone who may have an obvious bias. So those are the strikes we see. Those are the jurors that they're looking to eliminate. They're trying to get to the heart of whether or not they believe by asking these questions, these jurors have any innate bias that may swing them one way or the other. So that's why we're seeing the eliminations the way we are. You just heard Aaron talk about it. Um, the former president sitting there in court today didn't need to be there. Why do you think he chose to attend the jury selection process? You know, I think he chose to attend because good or bad, it may have a sway. I mean, when we're talking about someone who's as well recognized as him, he's going to have some supporters, people who think fondly of him. And so he may feel like having his presence there lends himself to not being possibly on the hook for as much money if he feels like he can sort of impose that sort of presence and personality into these proceedings. The judge stressed to the jurors today that they are not reviewing the verdict in the first case. Their job is entirely about the damages to be awarded here, keeping focus. How hard is it for that jury to separate uh, the crime from the damages in a case like this? You know, jurors always want to look back. They want to say, well, you know, is this a verdict I would have come to? But really, the judge did a good job because what they have to do is really focus on the verdict at hand. The verdict was already found, and they have a responsibility to simply look at damages. What were the damages, the extent of damages, and put a numerical value to that? So finally, Shauna, the judge has agreed to adjust the trial schedule so Trump can testify in the case next week. What will you be watching for when he takes the stand? Because any moment like that is a big moment. 
anytime the defendant takes a stand, it's going to be a big moment. Someone um, of his stature is really going to look to lend himself credibility to his side of the story, what he believes it should be. He's going to be looking to make an impression on that jury and to bring down those damages as much as he can. So we're going to want to look to see what his arguments are and how persuasive they seem to be with the jury. ABC Legal contributor Shauna Lloyd. Shauna, as always, thank you for your expertise in the conversation. Great to see you, Phil. ABC News has obtained audio of the 911 call requesting an ambulance for Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin on New Year's Day. Austin suffered complications from a surgery to treat prostate cancer, but raised concerns for not alerting the White House or senior officials at the Pentagon. In the 911 call, an aide to Austin asked the operator to keep the emergency response discreet. Take a listen. Can I can I ask? Like, can the ambulance not show up with lights and sirens? Um, we're trying to mm -hmm. remain a, a little subtle. Austin was released from the hospital on Monday after a two-week stay at Walter Reed Medical Center. Now to that massive winter blast putting more than 100 million people on alert for dangerous wind chills and record cold from Louisiana up to Maine. ABC senior meteorologist Rob Marciano is tracking the storm, but we are going to begin with Trevor Alt on its impact so far. Tonight, that Arctic blast dumping snow and ice fueling treacherous travel from the northeast to the deep south. Nearly half a foot of snow in spots, finally ending the snowless streak for many northeastern cities, but making for a white knuckle commute home for millions. Words of the wise, slow down. In Philadelphia, watch as this city bus loses control trying to climb a hill, crashing into parked cars. And on an ice-covered Interstate 65 north of Birmingham, Alabama, this tractor trailer swerving in all directions before jackknifing into the guardrail. And this was the scene overnight on the same interstate. The National Guard called in to help dozens of stranded drivers. The storms fueled by a record-breaking Arctic blast. In Chicago, where it felt like negative 30 this morning, they're using flames under the train tracks to keep them free of snow and ice. And in Allen, Texas, watch as this homeowner checking the frozen pipes on his pool is nearly blown away when the filter exploded. In the West, the rising risk for dangerous avalanches. New video shows the moment Bob Tillotson was rescued from an avalanche Saturday at American Fort Canyon in Utah. Rescuers digging through feet of snow, finally saving him. Tillotson says he was trapped for nearly 15 minutes. Trevor joins me now from JFK Airport here in New York. Trevor, how's this weather impacting travel across the country? Well, as you might imagine, Phil, it's an absolute mess. Just in the past two days across the country, there's been nearly 24,000 flights delayed or canceled. My flight tonight to Buffalo to keep covering these storms just joined that list. It's going to take several days for the airlines to fully get caught up. Phil? No doubt about that. All right, Trevor All, thanks so much. All right, now let's bring in senior meteorologist Rob Marciano, who's tracking this storm. Rob? Hey, Phil, well, this is winter for just about everybody now, and uh, what it has fallen as snow is going to stick around for most people because it's not going to get much warmer. Look at some of these numbers tomorrow. A lot of kids going back to school. It's going to be cold. The bus stop in D.C. too is what it's going to feel like, minus 7 in Nashville, and no big warm-up in sight. The pattern is such that we're going to see another reinforcing shot of cold air come the end of the week in Kansas City. You're back below 20 below for a wind chill, zero in Memphis, and maybe 13 or 15 below over the weekend in Chicago. Next storm up, it's hitting the Pacific Northwest right now. Rain and mountain snow that gets into the into the Wasatch and the Rockies. Avalanche warnings are up, and winter storm warnings for the park range here in Steamboat, Colorado. Could see one to two feet of snow come Friday morning. This storm progresses east pretty quickly into that cold air, and that means another pulse of snow for the northeast corner of the U.S. Hello, January. <laughs> Phil? Hello, indeed. Rob Marciano, thanks so much. Now to new developments in that alleged serial killer case just outside of New York City. Rex Hewerman, a New York architect and father, charged in the murder of three women, is now charged with a fourth murder, the result of sophisticated new DNA testing and some diligent investigators. Here's ABC's Stephanie Ramos. Tonight, suspected serial killer Rex Hewerman charged with murdering three women found on Gilgo Beach on Long Island, now indicted in the killing of a fourth victim. We've charged the murder of Maureen Brainerd Barnes to add to the, uh, to the already charged murders of 
um, Melissa Bartholomew, uh, Megan Waterman, and Amber Costello. Maureen Brainerd Barnes's remains found near the beach back in December 2010, along with three other women known as the Gilgo Four. In new court filings, prosecutors say cutting-edge DNA analysis linked Huerman's wife to female hair found on the buckle of a belt used to restrain Brainerd Barnes. It was uh, 7.9 trillion times more likely to have come from someone with the identical genetic profile as Asa Ellerup. To build their case, investigators also tracking Kuerman's daughter Victoria on a Long Island Railroad train, recovering a can of monster java she'd thrown in the trash for analysis. Kuerman's wife and daughter appearing at his arraignment today. Prosecutors say his family were out of town during the murders. I'm here to speak for my mom, Maureen. And tonight, Brainerd Barnes's daughter, Nicolette, speaking publicly for the first time. She was just seven years old when her mother was brutally murdered. While the loss of my mom has been extremely painful for me, the indictment by the grand jury has brought hope for justice for my mom and my family. Stephanie joins me now. Stephanie, what's next in this case? Well, Hureman's next court date has been set for February 6th. He has pleaded not guilty on all charges and is being held without bail. Authorities also told us today that they will continue to investigate the unsolved deaths of six other victims also found near Gilgo Beach, Phil. All right, Stephanie Ramos from Riverhead, New York tonight. Stephanie, thank you. U.S. officials are on high alert after several explosions were reported near the U.S. consulate in Erbil, the Kurdish region of Iraq. The missiles were launched by Iran's Revolutionary Guard Corps claiming to target a spy headquarters and anti-Iranian terrorist groups in Erbil. Four people were killed, six injured in the attack, none of them American forces. A U.S. official says no American facilities were damaged, but the State Department obviously condemning the strikes. Now to the Middle East. The U.S. carried out new airstrikes on Houthi missile facilities in Yemen today as those Iran-backed militants continued to target ships in the Red Sea. And we now have new details about a perilous mission off the coast of Somalia and the urgent search for two missing Navy SEALs. Here's ABC's Matt Gutman. Tonight, that desperate search for two Navy SEALs missing at sea in the Gulf of Aden during that daring nighttime mission. These new images tonight showing the U.S. efforts to disrupt the flow of weapons to Iranian-backed Houthi rebels. While boarding a suspected Yemeni weapon smuggling boat, one Navy SEAL fell into the sea. Following protocol, another senior NCO jumping in after him. The operation continuing with the SEALs seizing these weapons revealed in new images tonight. Materials used to build missiles, the same weapons deployed by the Houthis in at least 30 attacks on commercial shipping vessels. That's a significant operation that they haven't historically done. So this shows that they are escalating their interdiction operations and they're also uh, approving things that they typically do not. Tonight, the Pentagon saying it launched another round of airstrikes inside Yemen, destroying four Houthi anti-ship ballistic missiles prepared to launch. The operation marks the third round of retaliatory strikes against the Houthis since Thursday amid the ongoing attack on vessels in the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden since mid-November, disrupting one of the world's busiest shipping routes. And National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan warning there could be additional strikes. We anticipated the Houthis would continue to try to hold this critical artery at risk, and we continue to reserve the right to take further action, but this needs to be an all-hands-on-deck effort. Matt joins us now from Israel. And Matt, we understand the Biden administration is going to be coming out with a statement about the Houthis. Yeah, Phil, an official tells us the White House intends to put the Houthis back on the list of foreign terrorist organizations. Now, remember, back in 2021, President Biden removed the group from the list over concerns that that designation would cripple Yemen's economy and increase the risk of a growing famine there. Phil. All right. Matt Gutman from Tel Aviv tonight. Matt, thank you. From Israel to Japan, where two passenger jets collided on the tarmac of an airport in Hokkaido, a Korean airline plane carrying more than 280 passengers and crew made contact with another aircraft while both planes were on the ground. No injuries have been reported, but both planes, as you can see, were damaged. This incident coming just two weeks after a Japan Airlines flight collided with a Coast Guard plane and burst into flames on the tarmac in Tokyo. 
The Department of Justice announcing it will issue a report this week reviewing the law enforcement response to the deadly shooting at Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas. The DOJ's critical incident review will examine just how law enforcement responded to the incident that killed 19 children and two teachers in May of 2022. Families and state officials have all spoken out against the law enforcement response, in particular, about the 77 minutes it took nearly 400 law enforcement personnel to confront the killer. Still much more to get to here on Prime, the major court ruling on JetBlue's proposed merger with Spirit Airlines. But next, in our Prime Focus, as Congress continues to debate military aid for Ukraine, ABC's Tom Sufi Burrich travels to the front lines to meet the soldiers relying on U.S. weapons to protect their country and themselves. Because every, every uh, day of like hesitation or, or some pauses, uh, dozens and hundreds of lives, which cannot ever be brought back. U U.S. dithering about supporting Ukraine is, 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 is costing that many lives, you believe? Of course, definitely. Whenever news breaks, we are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back. Ukrainian President Zelensky made an impassioned appeal today at the World Economic Summit, calling President Putin's war in the region a threat to the free world. Putin hitting back, immediately claiming the initiative in the war is now with his forces. It comes as future U.S. military aid for Ukraine is stuck in Congress. The White House now saying the U.S. will make sure that Russia fails and Ukraine prevails, but that could largely hinge on what Congress does or doesn't do. ABC's Tom Sufi Burridge reports from Ukraine. <laughs> Readying, aiming, U.S. supplied firepower on the front lines in Ukraine. These M777 howitzers, a vital American tool for Ukrainian forces. And each gun firing thousands of rounds at Russian positions in a matter of months. Covering troops, storming Russian positions. But now Russia, with superior firepower, is on the front foot and is threatening a major new offensive just as the fate of more American military aid for Ukraine remains blocked by Congress. Time is running out and I'm, I'm damn serious to say that uh, even if we run out of uh, weapons, we will fight with shovels because what is at stake here for Ukraine is the existence of this nation. 
Our team taken to a Ukrainian artillery position near the front lines. This is the M777, an American gun hidden in this woodland. And shown their now scarce supply of artillery shells. Earlier in the war, the commander saying they could have had 200 rounds on any given day. There's about 20 here. No. Yeah. Is that a lot? It's a manoga? It's a mala. It's, 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 it's not. It's, it's a tiny amount for you. No. Just 20 shells. They know every round must count. Well, you can really feel the force of this American gun, but these Ukrainian artillery units are now having to limit the amount they fire because of the scarcity of ammunition. Are more Ukrainian troops being wounded and killed, your comrades, because of the scarcity of ammunition? Так вона вже відбувається не маленький період часу. Doctors taking shrapnel out of Volodymyr's back. At this medical stabilization point close to the front lines, they sometimes receive dozens of badly wounded men in a matter of hours. A long war and deep scars. So all in all I've seen I, I think like around 15,000 casualties. 15,000 casualties you've personally witnessed? Yes. So I, I've long passed the point where I emotionally react or I, I can assess the reality of what is happening. Volodymyr was hit by a Russian drone while recovering the body of a comrade killed in action. And to the west in Dnipro, 23,000 badly wounded soldiers treated in this one hospital since Russia invaded. Nazar losing an arm to a Russian drone. Ukrainian casualties are mounting. They're now bringing up to 100 heavily wounded Ukrainian soldiers to this one hospital in a single day. And that's a rise of up to 30%, say doctors, compared to a few weeks ago. And the future of American support high on soldiers and doctors' minds. Every uh, day of like hesitation or, or some pauses, uh, like dozens and hundreds of lives, which cannot ever be brought back. U U.S. dithering about supporting Ukraine is, 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 is costing that many lives, you believe? Of course, definitely. Ukraine now fortifying its lines of defence. A new Russian push could come in Kharkiv in the northeast, possibly ahead of Russian President Putin's expected re-election in March. Andrew Cox from Virginia suffering trauma to his brain while serving in the Ukrainian military, but promising to stay in this country whatever, saying American values are at stake. If losing the war, then Ukraine disappears to Russia. And what happens if Ukraine disappears as a country? What does it mean for America? What does it mean for, for the world? It's uh, the loss of a free nation. A democratic free nation? Yes. Ukraine now stepping up its own arms production, working to reduce its dependence on foreign weapons. We're the first TV journalists allowed inside this secret Ukrainian arms manufacturing facility. The company spreads its production thinly across multiple sites because of the threat from Russian missiles and drones. Here, they're testing mortar launchers. And these infantry vehicles built on the chassis and engine of a Ford SUV, which is fortified and armoured, ready for battle. Foreign Minister, thank you very much. Ukraine's top diplomat insisting more American weaponry for his country is money well spent and will deter other autocrats elsewhere. The cheapest way to keep the world in order is to, say, to send weapons, not your own troops and Ukraine has never asked for them. If the West is not able of uh, stopping Russia in Ukraine, who else is it able to stop in other parts of the world? China. You think China will... You have... You, I, I, leave, I leave these answers to you. You have, you have to reflect on this. While some US politicians reflect, Ukrainian volunteers are working flat out to produce these rudimentary but deadly drones. Russia's exploding drones 
are now one of its most feared weapons. But a grassroots Ukrainian movement is battling to make as many of these flying bombs for their troops. Drones are now one of the war's key munitions. Ukrainian ingenuity also here in this secret workshop for those American artillery guns. These military mechanics fighting to keep each howitzer firing. They make some of the spare parts themselves, but for other pieces that need replacing, they rely on that US military aid. You're here with US weaponry day in, day out. What would you say to someone in the US who is questioning the value of that military support for your country? Я кажу, то не люди просто, вони, ну, вони на цьому не зупиняться. Якщо вони візьмуть нас, вони підуть далі. Our thanks to Tom Sufi Burridge from the front lines in Ukraine. Still much more to get to tonight. Coming up, if you're fed up with those self-checkout machines, you're not alone. How some major retailers are responding. But next, making history from Elton John to Quinta Brunson by the numbers. So much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching? Watching Saturdays on ABC News Live. What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. In an interview, you talked about how you felt the boogeyman was coming. Yeah. But since I was a, a kid, I felt something's gonna get me. In the case of Jonathan Majors, the actor convicted of charges. What happened exactly, do you know? No, I don't know. She's unconscious. Your defense team has said that you were the victim of that night. Who received injuries? In the car. I did. Jonathan Majors Speaks, the Impact by Nightline exclusive, now streaming on Hulu. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part Part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. What You Need to Know, a third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. Me. I'm Marcus Moore covering the wildfires in Greece. Wherever the story is, we will take you there. You're streaming with ABC News Live. 
Welcome back. Well, some of us were watching the Iowa caucuses last night. The 75th Primetime Emmy Awards made history. Here are the highlights by the numbers. Elton John's farewell from Dodger Stadium, capping the 76-year-old's career win for Outstanding Variety Special and secured the Rocket Man as an EGOT. He's just the 19th person to win all four major entertainment awards, joining the ranks of Audrey Hepburn, Rita Moreno, Mel Brooks, Whoopi Goldberg, Jennifer Hudson. Abbott Elementary's Quinta Brunson became the second black actress to ever win Outstanding Lead Actress in a comedy series and the first to do so in more than 40 years. Iowa Debris was just the third black actress to win for Supporting Actress in a comedy series for her role in The Bear. HBO's Succession scooped up six awards for its final season, including its third best drama title, The Bear, also collecting six Emmys, including best comedy for its first season. And Beef went home with five trophies, including outstanding limited series. The awards were honoring shows from the 2022 television season. The ceremony delayed due to the writers and actors strikes. And there is much more ahead here on Prime tonight. What feature might be missing on your next Apple Watch as the company works around an import ban? And why some parents and kids are opting for sleep unders instead of sleepovers. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, from Poland once again tonight. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. Do you think you'll ever be able to go back home? We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Splintered houses and splintered lives. The magnitude of the devastation. You're streaming ABC News Live. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Santa Fe, New Mexico. Raleigh, North Carolina. The U.S. Capitol. Mayfield, Kentucky. Minneapolis. Mexico. Tongass National Forest, Alaska. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. Giving you a front row seat to our world as it plays out in real time, live. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights, America's most honored streaming news program, only on ABC News Live. Streaming free right now, wherever you stream your news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, start here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? 
Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, Yay. every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back. The backlash against self-checkout machines. Philadelphia saying goodbye to a beloved Philly and the increasingly popular alternative to kids' slumber parties. Those stories and more in tonight's rundown. In a win for the Biden administration, a federal judge is blocking JetBlue's purchase of Spirit Airlines for antitrust reasons. A ruling has sent Spirit stock price tumbling. It would have been a $3.8 billion deal and would have created the nation's fifth largest airline. But the court ruling would have caused airfares to rise. The judge saying getting rid of Spirit Airlines would have hurt cost-conscious travelers who rely on Spirit's low fares. It's last call for the alcohol delivery app Drizzly. Uber announcing it is shutting down the service just three years after the company purchased it for more than a billion dollars. At one point, Drizzly was the largest online marketplace for alcohol in North America. Uber says it's decided to focus on its core Uber Eats strategy. Self-checkout. You either love it or... I hate it. I hate it. If I'm going to do the work... Give me a discount. Several major retailers are listening and reevaluating their self checkouts. Some business analysts pointing less to customer satisfaction and more to inventory loss as part of the problem. One industry survey found that self checkout represented 30% of transactions in 2021 and that 96% of food retailers surveyed offered it at their stores. But with them come complaints of tech glitches and long lines. Target stores now limiting the number of items at their self-checkouts to reportedly shorten those wait times. Dollar General says it plans to ramp up its employee presence at the front of the stores, noting the convenience of self-checkout to some customers, but saying it does not reduce the importance of a friendly, helpful employee who is there to greet customers and assist while the checkout process is happening. We're all familiar with sleepovers from our childhoods, but these days the hottest parenting trend is sleep unders. The New York Times has written a deep dive into how and why the traditional sleepover has evolved over the last few years. It's a great option for parents who aren't comfortable with their kids staying the entire night at a friend's house. So they pick up their kid at 1, 2 a.m. Even parents are taking this option more and more since the pandemic, I've noticed, because they want their kids to stay connected, to feel a part of a group. It's also a great option for parents who culturally don't understand or agree with the idea of a sleepover. For a lot of people, it's something that they never did, that their parents never let them do. So this is a really good compromise. As sleep unders become increasingly common, experts have some advice for parents looking to try it out. But also it's very important that they know that they have an out, right? So you can have a safe word. So you can call to say goodnight to your kid and if they use the safe word, maybe it's like, oh, I didn't bring my teddy bear. <laughs> Philadelphia Eagles star Jason Kelsey is retiring after 13 seasons. ESPN reports he broke the news to teammates following last night's playoff loss to Tampa Bay. Kelsey beloved in Philly, helping lead the team to its first and only Super Bowl win. He and his brother Travis famously went ahead in last year's Super Bowl between the Eagles and Chiefs. Travis won that one. Don't worry about me, gonna save you. A harrowing rescue. Firefighter Logan Hadley attempting to save Bob the dog. It's okay, come here. Take a look as Bob thrashes around in the freezing waters, trapped by an ice shelf. Hadley bravely crawling on all fours while Bob's owner can be heard trying to calm the pup down. Bob, be good. Bob paddling over to Hadley, but then gets nervous. He's trying to bite his face. The two finally making it out of the water to a rousing round of applause. We train for stuff like that, but this is the first time we've actually uh, had an ice rescue, to my knowledge. Um, we do have other animal rescues, like we've gotten uh, ducks out of grates or cats off of roof or something like that. Um, but this is our first time we've gotten a dog out of the water. New video showing the moments a man ran onto the tarmac at a major U.S. airport and right up to a passenger plane. Now the airport says it is working with local authorities, the NTSB and the FAA, to figure out how the man was able to make his way through some of the most sensitive security areas, ending up in the engine of an airplane. ABC's Ariel Reshef with more. 
Those chilling moments, authorities say a man breached security at Salt Lake City International Airport, running right onto the tarmac and into a plane's engine, later dying. They are on the taxiway, found his clothes. In this dramatic surveillance video obtained by Salt Lake City Fox affiliate KSTU from New Year's Day, 30-year-old Kyler Effinger is seen trying to open the door at an empty gate, only a maintenance worker there. He then runs to another gate, pulling on that door, throwing his shoe at the window before finding an emergency exit and making his way down a stairwell and onto the airfield. Effinger's father telling ABC News his son, who has suffered from mental health issues, was heading to Colorado, but got held up going through security, causing him to miss his flight. Police saying a store manager first alerted authorities to a disturbance involving a passenger. Um, wanting to file a report on a white male individual that is harassing his employees and accusing them of stealing his bag. The uh, male is wearing a yellow jersey, brown pants. With no shoes. Salt Lake City police responding, but they say they initially couldn't locate him. Cameras capturing Effinger running toward a Delta flight sitting on the de icing pad before taking off to San Francisco. Just minutes later, police finding Effinger in the engine's intake cowling, unconscious, unable to revive him. Police speaking with ABC affiliate KTVX earlier this month. The exact stage of the engine's operation remain under investigation, but the air blades were circulating when officers arrived on scene. Now, questions about how the 30-year-old was able to get to the tarmac so easily. That there wasn't anybody on surveillance video or there wasn't anybody uh, with responsibility for security in the hallways that saw him after he made several attempts to get out of doors that were protected by pad keys. Uh, that's, that's disturbing. Our thanks to Ariel Reshef. Actor and producer Benjamin Bratt has thrown his support behind a documentary that is on this year's Oscar nomination shortlist. Wings of Dust tells a story from the perspective of a Peruvian journalist who says he's fighting to save the land of his ancestors, his community, and future generations. Here's ABC's Stephanie Ramos. Stunning cinematography takes us high above the serene landscape of the Peruvian town of Espinat. Wings of Dust, a 30-minute short, has already received top honors at the Student Academy Awards and impressively made this year's Oscar nomination shortlist. Shot and produced by recent NYU grad and Italian native Giorgio Giotto, along with producer Eliza Mitnick. Their film follows the apparent struggle of indigenous Peruvian journalist Vidal Merma. For two months, the documentary immerses viewers into Vidal's day-to-day -day life of activism, including his claims that two mining companies are damaging the area. We see, up close, the land where Vidal was born and raised, and how he says it has changed significantly for the worst. And you grew up in that town. Was it always like that? Usted se crió en ese pueblo, verdad? Vidal tells us, when I was born and as a young child, I still had the opportunity to enjoy a healthy environment with clean water and was also surrounded by beautiful mountains. The producers tell us they intentionally left out the names of the mining companies for Vidal's safety, and some of Vidal's claims cannot be verified. As of today, the Peruvian government has not publicly commented on Vidal's claims. What I feel like is very important here is to have the responsibility to show examples through documentaries. Examples like him of resilience, of strength, of devotions. In the documentary, Vidal says it has been an uphill battle to be heard, even by his own government. Vidal says, once I found out that the issue was quite serious, it's when I began to spread the word and make the issue visible. According to the documentary, Vidal is facing numerous criminal investigations, hefty fines and jail time. He says his safety is in constant jeopardy. Vidal says, I have continued to report until now. I have still been threatened numerous times. Benjamin Bratt, best known for starring roles in Law and & Order and films like Miss Congeniality and Piñero, says he was compelled to come on board as an executive producer and use his production company as a vehicle to elevate Wings of Dust to a global platform. My mother's mother is from that same region in Cusco. 
um, there was no way we could turn a blind eye to it. Your mother did a wonderful job by instilling this character and teaching you about your identity and where you come from and the land. My mother, who uh, came to this country at the age of 14, uh, always inculcated in us uh, a, a real true pride in our indigenous heritage. In 1969, she became very active in the American Indian rights movement and was part of the Indian occupation at Alcatraz, an island on which I lived for 18 months as a child. My mother is 87 years old. She's now a professional grandmother, but for my brother and I especially, this is our way to put a flower on her now because we have nothing but gratitude to her for everything she's done. Brett says he and Giotto have become like brothers working on this project, and they're hoping, of course, for an Academy Award nomination, but more importantly, global attention. You know, the headline of this film is the fight for water and dignity. Water, we know why, but dignity, because there are so many people that are unheard. Stephanie Ramos, thank you for that. And Apple will remove a blood oxygen sensor from some of its watch models. The move comes after the U.S. International Trade Commission banned imports of two Apple watch models over a patent dispute with medical technology company Massimo. Uh, to get around that ban and continue to sell the watches, Apple reportedly redesigned its products without the blood oxygen sensor. After five long years, HBO's critically acclaimed show True Detective is finally back. This season, focusing on a case of eight scientists who mysteriously vanish from an Arctic research station in the fictional rural town of Ennis, Alaska. As authorities look for answers, they find themselves with even more questions. Take a look. What do you want? It's been six years. Why are you here? Because we both know what really happened. And you need my help. I've seen that before, years ago. Fine. I'm just gonna do this one thing. Work together to close this case. And that's it for the two of us. It is. So, you want in or what? Joining us now is actor, activist, and boxing world champion, Kaylee Reese. Kaylee, thanks so much for joining us. That's intense. That is very intense. We, we understand more than two million people reportedly watched the first episode this past Sunday. Start by talking to me uh, a little bit about your character, Evangeline, and this season of True Detective. Oh man, Evangeline Navarro, she's such a layered and complex character, but she brings so much um, actually softness and vulnerability to this, this season, I think. And the contrast between her and Danvers is just one that sticks to the true detective, the true, true detective ways. And Evangeline is from a new Piac and Dominican background. So she's uh, part of the community that she patrols. And she has a lot of dark secrets and she's battling between two worlds, not only between being part of the community and also being a police officer or an Alaskan state trooper, but the instinctual spiritual part of the world and the reality part of the world. She's trying to balance those two. We see indigenous <laughs> representation this season with indigenous actors and indigenous peoples focused storylines. Uh, I'm wondering what does the indigenous representation mean to you and for the show? I mean, it's everything. I didn't grow up seeing faces like mine, especially being of mixed indigenous Wampanoag and Cape Verdean heritage. And just like my character, I walk between two worlds and not being enough for either. We have someone like Lily Gladstone that just knocked down barriers by being the first native artist and actress to win a Golden Globe. So representation is everything. It's time for us to tell our stories and not just stories in the past, we need contemporary stories and we need representation, not because a box needs to be checked, but because we're good artists and we fit the, the part. Right. And your story is particularly amazing. You're the first indigenous boxing world champion. Um, and you've only been acting for a short period of time, relatively speaking. Uh, and that clip is with Jodie Foster. I mean, talk a little bit about working with her so soon in an acting career and how amazing is it? It's such an amazing opportunity to get this thought I had of trying something new and just kind of getting hit, hit in the ground running, kind of getting pushed in the deep end. I compare it to being able to train with one of the greatest, Mike Tyson in his prime. I mean, mm. I get to learn from this legend, around this legend, see how she operates in her territory, and see, um, just being able to collaborate with, with these storytellers. It was such an honor, and she's not only an amazing uh, 
legend in the acting world, but she's also a legendary human. We're also seeing that this season, women are really taking the helm of the narrative as Evangeline, a uh, military veteran, source of strength and protection for not only her sister, but many other, many other women in the community. How were you able to balance, as an actor, the no-nonsense ferocity and soft vulnerability at the same time? I mean, like I said, you're a new actor, too, and that's a... That's a dynamic duo right there. Navarro's true strength and is, is in her vulnerability and her ability to have a different perspective as well as Danvers and to relate to these victims and the crimes and the criminals in a different way, not just because they're female, but it's just a whole different perspective, not just because, you know, the first season was male and they're females, but it's a whole different perspective. We also learned about the case of a missing indigenous woman uh, in the series. Yes. And as an activist, you have used your platform to advocate for the murdered and missing indigenous women and girls organization. Um, so how did did your activism influence your approach to that storyline? You know, um, learning about Issa's work and how she brings missing women, because uh, she's from Mexico, she's Mexican, and she, you know, that's a big problem, not just in America, it's indigenous women, indigenous people usually get targeted no matter where you go. So bringing that element into her work naturally and just kind of having this activism, um, we're bringing awareness to MMIW or Missing and Murdered Indigenous People with my boxing platform, it was just another platform to bring this issue, this very serious issue, into front of an audience that wouldn't normally hear about it. And also that the realism of this, it just doesn't happen in just these rural areas. It doesn't happen in just one area. You're getting entertained as well as not beating over the head with the issue, but it's getting entertained and also educated at the same time. Kaylee Reese, such a, such a pleasure speaking with you. Thank Thanks you. so much for coming in. Um, you can watch True Detective Night Country on HBO. HBO, Sunday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern, and also streaming, of course, on Max. So a librarian is paying his love of reading forward in a very big way. ABC's Danny New spoke with the librarian who has become world famous for his catchphrase, having fun isn't hard when you've got a library card. The joy of the library might be the universal language. Michael Threets has perhaps become the Internet's most beloved librarian. I consider myself sort of like a disciple of Mr. Rogers, LeVar Burton, and Bob Ross. We don't make mistakes, just happy accidents. Most of his videos come from the Fairfield Civic Center Library in Solano County, California, where Michael is a supervising librarian. Five years old, that's when I got my first library card. But here's the thing, guess where he was checking out all those books when he was younger? It is my journey from library kid to being in charge of a library that I grew up in. That's incredible. You have your library card tattooed on you, right? No? And look at that. A few decades later, he even now has a library card tattoo. And he tells his millions of followers on social media constantly that they need to get one too. The card, not the ink. Whenever I sign a library kid up for a library card, I'm like, congratulations, you just got a library card. You have no idea like how important, how amazing that is. Trigger warning. Loss. Grief. But for Michael, who has suffered through depression and anxiety during his life, it's also very important to him that his library and his feed are a safe space for more than discussing books. People like respond, like message me and say, thank you for talking about anxiety. Thank you for talking about depression. Like, thank you for thank you for talking about like it's okay if you're not okay. My heart is overflowing with library joy right now. And if you need some help, Michael knows one place you can start. We're all neighbors, we're all together. We all need our libraries. Amazing, you can see the joy he gets just right in his face. Danny, thank you so much. That's our show for this hour. I'm Phil Lipoff. Stay with ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. And thanks for streaming with us. And coming up in the next hour, as the Republican presidential primary heads to New Hampshire now, our Mary Bruce sat down for an exclusive interview with Vice President Kamala Harris, what she has to say about the Republican field. And the deep freeze blanketing most of the country. How much longer will it last? Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, start here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. From America's
America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. In an interview, you talked about how you felt the boogeyman was coming. Yeah. But since I was a, a, a kid, I felt something's gonna get me. The case of Jonathan Majors, the actor convicted of charges. What happened exactly, do you know? No, I don't know. She's unconscious. Your defense team has said that you were the victim of that night. Who received injuries in the car? I did. Jonathan Majors Speaks, the Impact by Nightline exclusive, now streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back and good evening. This is ABC News Live Prime. I'm Phil Lipoff in tonight for Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We've got a lot of news to get to this evening, but we are going to begin with President Trump's decisive victory in Iowa. Trump dominated the Iowa caucuses last night, defeating GOP presidential hopefuls Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis with more than half of all the votes. Fresh off that win, flying immediately to federal court here in New York City to defend himself in a defamation case brought by writer E. Jean Carroll. As the field narrows in the race to the White House, ABC's Rachel Scott has it all covered on the campaign trail. Less than 24 hours after a blowout victory in Iowa, Donald Trump heading straight to a Manhattan courtroom, choosing to attend day one of the defamation case against him by writer E. Jean Carroll. A jury will determine how much he owes Carroll in damages. After court, it was on to New Hampshire, Trump hoping to cement his lock on the Republican nomination. I really think this is time now for everybody, our country, to come together. We want to come together. Trump won Iowa with 51% of the vote, smashing historical records. Still, nearly half of Republicans chose someone other than the former president, and turnout was low, just 14% of Republicans showing up to caucus. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis coming in second, with former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley right behind him. Haley flying into New Hampshire, where polls have her within single digits of Trump. She says it's now a two-person race, Haley versus Trump, 
and she's refusing to participate in any debates without him. Just to put a finer point on it, you're not going to do a debate here in New Hampshire unless Donald Trump is on the stage. I mean, that's who I'm running against. There is nobody else I need to debate. I have had five strong debates and have done plenty of them. He can't hide forever. At some point, he's got to get on a debate. DeSantis, who trails in New Hampshire, hopscotching ahead to Haley's home state of South Carolina, which holds its primary on February 24th. Look, she was governor here for six years. Can you name major achievements under her tenure? I mean, t tell me if there are, because she hasn't been able to do it. Haley brushing it off. I'm sure he had a great time. South Carolina is a great state, but he's in single digits in South Carolina and single digits in New Hampshire. He's been invisible in both states. He is not my concern. I'm going after Trump. Oh, thanks to Rachel Scott for that. And now to the massive winter blast, putting more than 100 million people on alert for dangerous wind chills and record cold from Louisiana up to Maine. ABC senior meteorologist Rob Marciano is tracking the storm, but we are going to begin with Trevor Alt on its impact so far. Tonight, that Arctic blast dumping snow and ice fueling treacherous travel from the northeast to the deep south. Nearly half a foot of snow in spots, finally ending the snowless streak for many northeastern cities, but making for a white knuckle commute home for millions. Words of the wise, slow down. In Philadelphia, watch as this city bus loses control trying to climb a hill, crashing into parked cars. And on an ice-covered Interstate 65 north of Birmingham, Alabama, this tractor trailer swerving in all directions before jackknifing into the guardrail. And this was the scene overnight on the same interstate. The National Guard called in to help dozens of stranded drivers. The storms fueled by a record-breaking Arctic blast. In Chicago, where it felt like negative 30 this morning, they're using flames under the train tracks to keep them free of snow and ice. And in Allen, Texas, watch as this homeowner checking the frozen pipes on his pool is nearly blown away when the filter exploded. In the West, the rising risk for dangerous avalanches. New video shows the moment Bob Tillotson was rescued from an avalanche Saturday at American Fort Canyon in Utah. Rescuers digging through feet of snow, finally saving him. Tillotson says he was trapped for nearly 15 minutes. All right, Trevor, thank you. All right, now let's bring in senior meteorologist Rob Marciano, who's tracking this storm. Rob. Hey, Phil, well, this is winter for just about everybody now, and uh, what it has fallen as snow is going to stick around for most people because it's not going to get much warmer. Look at some of these numbers tomorrow. A lot of kids going back to school. It's going to be cold. The bus stop in D.C. too is what it's going to feel like, minus 7 in Nashville, and no big warm-up in sight. The pattern is such that we're going to see another reinforcing shot of cold air come the end of the week in Kansas City. You're back below 20 below for a wind chill, zero in Memphis, and maybe 13 or 15 below over the weekend in Chicago. Next storm up, it's hitting the Pacific Northwest right now. Rain and mountain snow that gets into the, into the Wasatch and the Rockies. Avalanche warnings are up, and winter storm warnings for the park range here in Steamboat, Colorado. Could see one to two feet of snow come Friday morning. This storm progresses east pretty quickly into that cold air, and that means another pulse of snow for the northeast corner of the U.S. Hello, January. <laughs> Phil? Hello, indeed. Rob Marciano, thanks so much. Now to new developments in that alleged serial killer case just outside of New York City. Rex Hewerman, a New York architect and father charged in the murder of three women, is now charged with a fourth murder. The result of sophisticated new DNA testing and some really diligent investigators. Here's ABC Stephanie Ramos. Tonight, suspected serial killer Rex Hewerman, charged with murdering three women found on Gilgo Beach on Long Island, now indicted in the killing of a fourth victim. We've charged the murder of Maureen Brainerd Barnes to add to the, uh, to the already charged murders of um, Melissa Bartholomew. Uh, Megan Waterman and Amber Costello. Maureen Brainerd Barnes's remains found near the beach back in December 2010, along with three other women known as the Gilgo Four. In new court filings, prosecutors say cutting edge DNA analysis linked Hewerman's wife to female hair found on the buckle of a belt used to restrain Brainerd Barnes. It was uh, 7.9 trillion times more likely to have come from someone with the identical genetic profile as Asa Ellerup. To build their case, investigators also tracking Kuerman's daughter, Victoria, on a Long Island Railroad train, recovering a can of monster java she'd thrown in the trash for analysis. 
Huerman's wife and daughter appearing at his arraignment today. Prosecutors say his family were out of town during the murders. I'm here to speak for my mom, Maureen. And tonight, Brainerd Barnes's daughter, Nicolette, speaking publicly for the first time. She was just seven years old when her mother was brutally murdered. While the loss of my mom has been extremely painful for me, the indictment by the grand jury has brought hope for justice for my mom and my family. Stephanie Ramos for us tonight. Stephanie, thank you. Now to the Middle East, a U.S. official telling ABC News that the White House intends to put the Houthis back on the list of foreign terrorist organizations in response to the Iran-backed militants' continued attacks on ships in the Red Sea. Meantime today, U.S. carried out new airstrikes on Houthi missile facilities in Yemen. Plus, we have new details tonight as well about that perilous mission off the coast of Somalia and the urgent search for two missing Navy SEALs. Here's Matt Gutman. Tonight, that desperate search for two Navy SEALs missing at sea in the Gulf of Aden during that daring nighttime mission. These new images tonight showing the U.S. efforts to disrupt the flow of weapons to Iranian-backed Houthi rebels. While boarding a suspected weapons smuggling boat, one Navy SEAL fell into the sea, and following protocol, another SEAL jumped after him. The operation continuing with the SEALs seizing these weapons revealed in new images tonight. Materials used to build missiles, the same weapons deployed by the Houthis in at least 30 attacks on commercial shipping vessels. That's a significant operation that they haven't historically done. So this shows that they are escalating their interdiction operations and they're also uh, approving things that they typically do not. Tonight, the Pentagon saying it launched another round of airstrikes inside Yemen, destroying four Houthi anti-ship ballistic missiles prepared to launch. The operation marks the third round of retaliatory strikes against the Houthis since Thursday amid the ongoing attack on vessels in the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden since mid-November, disrupting one of the world's busiest shipping routes. And National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan warning there could be additional strikes. We anticipated the Houthis would continue to try to hold this critical artery at risk, and we continue to reserve the right to take further action, but this needs to be an all-hands-on-deck effort. Matt Gutman tonight from Tel Aviv. Matt, thank you. Still much more to get to coming up. Our wrap of all the Emmy highlights, the reunions, the jokes, the big wins. But next, our exclusive interview with Vice President Harris, what she is saying about the 2024 race for the White House. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In Rolling Fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. In Dnipro, Ukraine, I'm Martha Raddatz. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. 
Welcome back. We are tracking several headlines around the world at this hour. First to southern Gaza, where Palestinians in Rafah have been lining up for hours to receive food, but it is not enough to feed all of their families. All of Gaza's 2.3 million people face crisis levels of hunger, according to a UN-backed report in December. Meantime, footage released by the Israeli army reportedly shows a Hamas tunnel shaft under the main highway of the Gaza Strip. The IDF says it's now destroyed a 15-meter deep shaft, which they called the tunnels where everything started. And in the Indian Ocean, a cyclone lashed the island nation of Mauritius with heavy rain and severe flooding on Monday. Dozens of vehicles were submerged in water, drivers scrambling to escape, see seeking safety on top of their cars. Residents were urged to stay inside their homes, turn off their power, and stop using their tap water. And North Korean leader Kim Jong-un has declared South Korea their, quote, principal enemy, abandoning reconciliation efforts. In a speech to North Korea's rubber stamp parliament, Kim called for an amendment to the Constitution to define the North as a territory separate from South Korea. This marks an historic shift from efforts to unite as one Korea and comes amid heightened tensions over Kim's weapons development and military exercises in the South. The Iowa caucuses have come and gone, giving former President Donald Trump his first victory of the season. And as the season goes on, the White House is keenly aware of what's at stake. Our chief White House correspondent, Mary Bruce, sat down one-on-one -on -one with Vice President Kamala Harris to talk about the potential of running against Trump again. While all eyes were on Iowa and the first Republican votes cast... Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We hit the road with Vice President Kamala Harris, getting exclusive access as she campaigned in Democrats' first primary state. We're headed to South Carolina, getting an exclusive look inside the Biden-Harris campaign, just as the 2024 race steps into high gear. Back in 2020, it was South Carolina's Democratic voters who revived Joe Biden's campaign, catapulting him toward the nomination. Three years later, the Biden-Harris campaign is hoping that enthusiasm is still here. Mary Bruce with ABC. We traveled aboard Air Force Two, touching down in South Carolina. There, as Harris was snapping photos and shaking hands and getting ready to mark Martin Luther King Jr. Day, enjoying the music from backstage. <laughs> then walking out to the steps of the state capitol to lay out what's at stake in this election. Well, as vice president of the United States, I'd say at this moment in America, Freedom is under profound threat. <laughs> then she was off to thank supporters at Big T's Barbecue. <laughs> urging them to help get out the vote. And we gotta remind people that the primary is on a Saturday. because people... Harris has been taking on an expanded role on the campaign trail. By our count, visiting at least 18 states in the last six months. She's taking the lead on issues like abortion rights and voting rights. And taking swipes at their Republican rivals. The hypocrisy abounds. Yeah. Passing laws to deny women the ability to make decisions about their own body. One does not have to abandon their faith nope. or deeply held beliefs to agree. The government should not be telling her what to do with her body. Yeah. After a surprise stop at the University of South Carolina to greet their undefeated women's basketball team, we got a chance to ask the vice president about their campaign strategy. Do you think Donald Trump at this point is a foregone conclusion? I don't know, but look, if it is Donald Trump, we've beat him before and we'll beat him again. Uh, when you, again, look at all of the issues that are at stake, including our standing in the world, I think that the people of America um, want more in terms of um, the outcome of this election and, and, and charting the, the course for the future of our country. You've been confident, your campaign has been confident. Mm -hmm. Some are concerned you all may be a little too confident. And why not go out and attack no. Donald Trump, go after his legal challenges? What are you guys waiting for? Well, let me just tell you something. I am of the school that you either run without an opponent or you run scared. <laughs> I have learned that to be a fact, and that is the way that I feel about any election. So absolutely not. You can't take anything for granted. And we have a duty, a responsibility to earn 
this real act. And that's why I'm out here in South Carolina. It's a state where the black vote is critical. But even some Democrats, like close Biden ally Congressman Jim Clyburn, say they're concerned about the campaign's standing with black voters. How concerned are you that this key constituency may sit this one out? You got to earn the votes. And the votes are going to be earned based on one in a reelect. Have you actually responded to the needs of the community? We have done the work that has been about bringing down unemployment, black unemployment, to some of the lowest numbers we've ever seen. What we've done on student loan debt, we have now erased student loan debt for over three and a half million people and with more to do. So we've delivered, but the responsibility but is the message we getting across? Well, that's why I'm out here. We have a responsibility to communicate. We've done really good work. Our challenge will be to let people know who brought it to them. But also top of mind for voters, the president's age. Already the oldest sitting president, Biden would be 86 years old at the end of a second term. Our latest polling shows only 28 percent of Americans now say Biden has the mental sharpness to serve another four years. That's down from around 50 percent in May of 2020. You obviously can't change the president's age. So what is your plan to try and change this perception? How well, do you do that? I'll tell you the reality of it is, and I spent a lot of time with President Biden, be it in the Oval Office, in the Situation Room, and other places. He is extraordinarily smart. He has the ability to see around the corner in terms of what might be the challenges we face as a nation or globally. But it doesn't seem that that's getting out and resonating with Americans, with a lot of your supporters. How do you cut through that and make sure that they're seeing the Joe Biden that you were just describing? Well, I mean, listen, you've, you're here with me in South Carolina. You saw every room we went in, the numbers of people who are there applauding quite loudly. And they're applauding for me and they're applauding for Joe Biden and for what we as an administration have accomplished. They're there because they believe in what we're doing and they want to see us continue to do this work. Another area where Biden is struggling to break through, immigration. A critical issue for voters. Our polling shows just 18 percent of Americans approve of Biden's handling of the issue. And now even some Democratic officials at the local level are voicing frustration as they deal with an influx of migrants. You know, New York Mayor Adams says even the compromises and the bipartisan issues that have been discussed as part of this bigger funding package, he says that's not enough. And he says there's a lack of urgency in Washington on this issue. Does your administration bear responsibility for that? It is no secret for anyone that we have a broken immigration system and it needs to be fixed. And it would be great if we could get some bipartisan consensus to do just that. And uh, I think it's a tragedy that there are certain so-called leaders who are playing politics with this issue. Our first bill, the first bill right after inauguration that President Biden put before Congress was to fix our immigration system. Do you think that they've taken it up? No. So where are you willing to compromise on this issue? The president has said, you know, you're talking about this. You're willing to make some concessions on this. Where? Well, let me just tell you, first of all, we have a security package that includes $15 billion that should go to address the border. It'd be great if they took it up. With a potential Biden-Trump rematch on the horizon, the Biden-Harris campaign says in the coming months, voters will be presented with a stark choice. And they're gearing up for a tough fight. Given what you say is on the line, are you surprised at how close, at how hard fought this campaign is expected to be this race? Well, I mean, we're talking about an election for president of the United States, vice president of the United States, and um, we have to earn that reelect. And I mean, these are challenging times, but you are right. When I talk about it in the way that I do, it is because I have been traveling our country and it is clear to me that there is an intent to attack these most fundamental freedoms and liberties. Our thanks to Mary Bruce and, and, and the vice president. Still to come tonight, our big Emmy wrap up from the big night for women of color to the heartwarming and hilarious speeches. We're going to have it all for you. 
do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Hi, <laughs> Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Finally tonight, after weeks of waiting and delays because of the Hollywood writers and actors strikes, it was television's golden night, and the 2023 Emmys were well worth the wait. The show was packed with reunions, funny moments, and a final goodbye to the big winner of the night, Succession. Here's Lara Spencer. Television's biggest night, finally back for its 75th anniversary. Hello, friends. And welcome to our Emmy's neighborhood. The Emmy saying, yes, chef, to the bear. The FX and Hulu series sweeping all of its categories in its first year of competition, with six Emmys, including Outstanding Comedy Series. Stars Jeremy Allen White, Evan Moss Backrack, and Io Debri all nabbing acting awards. Probably not like a dream to emigrate to this country and have your child be like, I want to do improv, but um, you're real ones. Uh, Thank you so much for this. It means the world. Thank you. And succession, tying the bear for most wins, taking one last victory lap for its final season, including the coveted award for Outstanding Drama Series. We are so honored. We've loved making this show. Sarah Snook winning lead dramatic actress for her performance as Shiv Roy, pregnant during filming, and now telling her daughter what she couldn't back then. The proximity of her life growing inside me gave me the strength to uh, do this and this performance. And uh, I love you so much. And it's all for you from here on out. Thank you. And Snook's on-screen brother, Kieran Culkin, beating out co-stars Brian Cox and Jeremy Strong for lead actor. Uh, I wasted all my time hugging everybody. I love you all so much. Um, especially everyone in the cast, uh, Jay, Alan, Sarah, Brian, every single one. Thank you so much. And the voters have no beef with beef. The limited series nabbing five statues. Ali Wong making history as the first woman of Asian descent to ever win for a leading role. I wouldn't be standing here without my parents, my amazing parents, my my mother um, and, and my father, who I so wish was alive to share this moment with me, my hilarious father, who loved me unconditionally and taught me the value of failure. And her co-star Stephen Yun also winning his category. The night tying the record for the most winning actors and actresses of color. Quinta Brunson, the first black lead actress to win for a comedy in over 40 years. Thank you so much. Um, I love making Abbott Elementary so much, and I am so happy to be able to live my dream and act out comedy. I want to thank me. And Nisi Nash Betts taking home the prize for Outstanding Supporting Actress in a Limited Series and for the best speech of the night. I accept this award on behalf of every black and brown woman who has gone unheard yet over policed, like Glenda Cleveland, like Sandra Bland, like Breonna Taylor. As an artist, my job is to speak true to power, and baby, I'm gonna do it to the day I die.
first time host, Blackish star Anthony Anderson, leading us through the eventful night with a little help from mom as timekeeper. Attempting to wrap the always hilarious Jennifer Coolidge during her win for supporting actress in a drama. I want to thank all the evil gays. You know, I just really, really, I just, especially, you know, yes. Francesco and Bruno, Baby. thank you. I know I'm getting wrapped it up. Okay, yes, okay. Baby. And, um, yes, and um, I, I just... I love you, baby, but time. Okay, guess what? Guess what? One more thing. I love, I love you, you, too. I just want to say one thing. And in a surprise appearance, a familiar face returning to the stage, Christina Applegate, who's been open about her battle with MS, walking out to a standing ovation. You're totally shaming me with disability by standing up. It's fine. Okay. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Body, not by Ozempic. Okay, let's go. Keeping that sense of humor. That was a beautiful moment. Lara, thank you. And that's our show for tonight. I'm Phil Lipoff. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, Pluto TV, the ABC News app, and of course, abcnews.com. Good night. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families.